Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming to tonight's event here at Japanos London. And tonight we are very much delighted to have um, six-time Paralympian Noel Thatcher to give um, an introduction on uh, the legacy of the Tokyo 1964 uh, Olympic and Paralympic Games and also on the evolution of parasport. And we are also joined uh, by an online audience tonight as this talk is currently being uh, live streamed on Japanos London social media channels, so on Facebook, YouTube and LinkedIn. So thank you very much for watching. Um, for those of you attending in person, following Noah's talk, there will be a special screening of the film Tokyo Paralympics Festival of Love and Glory, which is an intimate account of the uh, Tokyo Paralympic Games of 1964 and allows insights on the life of the athletes and, um, and their participation that helped raise disability awareness in Japan in 1964. Um, so, let me just introduce our speaker for tonight. Noel Thatcher is a six-time Paralympian representing Great Britain in athletics between 1984 and 2004, winning a total of 10 medals, including five gold at distances from 400 to 10,000 meters. He first visited Japan in 1992, where he competed in the first World Marathon Cup for the visually impaired in Miyazaki. He raced and trained extensively all over Japan and spoke in schools and universities on parasport and disability issues. Noel studied Japanese at SOAS, achieving the JLPT Level 1 in 2003 and becoming the first visually impaired person to do so. He took third place in the 1997 Sir Peter Parker Business Japanese Speech Contest and leading up to the Tokyo 2020 Paralympics, he worked closely with the Embassy of Japan, Japan Foundation and the Japan Council and Daiwa Foundation and worked with the Paralympics GB, UK Sport and the English Institute of Sport and a number of national sports governing bodies teaching Japanese language and cultures. Noel is also co-host of the Japan Sports Stories podcast along with Michael Salter. So without further ado, please welcome Noel Tache. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, konbanwa, and good evening, everybody. Thank you, Federica. Um, that's quite a CV. Um, but <laughs> um, what kind of introduction should I say? Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here this evening um, at Japan House London. It's lovely to be connecting again and talking about Japan and sport. I've just realised I'm standing in the wrong place, so I'm going to move over here. Um, as Federica says, I wear many hats um, in my real-time day job. I'm actually a physiotherapist, but I have um, trained and raced ex extensively in Japan. I've taught Japanese to a number of British sporting organizations. But probably at, the, at, at this point in time, and most relevant to this evening, I am um, co-host, as Federica said, of the Japan Sports Stories podcast. Um, the Japan Sports Stories podcast was a project born out of a conversation with my co-host Mike Salter, who at the time was working for the Japan Foundation in London. And we shared the train journey back from Manchester, where we'd been teaching Japanese to the Paralympics GB coaching staff, and, and telling some of the stories of, of, of our connections to Japan. Both of us had, had lived and, and uh, in my case, trained in, in Nagano. And, but there was a shared frustration between the two of us that an awful lot of the stories that, that we, we'd come across and the stories of some absolutely amazing Japanese athletes had never seen the light of day. There was a dearth of information um, about these amazing athletes and amazing people in the English language. And the Japan Sports Stories podcast was, was and still is an ongoing project to give those athletes a platform, to give those stories um, that... Uh, a platform in the English language so please do check out the Japan Sports Stories podcast and if any of those if any of you have a connection with Japan or on sport and you know someone you think might make a great guest come up to me afterwards we'd be delighted to talk to people while I am um, thanking people other than Japan House London and your good selves um, everybody who's watching online thank you very much for joining us this Friday evening I'd also like to thank the Japan Sports Stories podcast's um, partners, uh, the Japan Research Centre at SOAS, University of London, um, with generous support from the Toshiba Foundation, and also not forgetting Mike Salter himself, who sadly can't be here this evening to join me. Um, I'm doing, in the, in, in the spirit 
1964, I've decided to do handheld, uh, handwritten notes on a piece of paper um, where my 10 year old son probably would have done a PowerPoint. So bear with me because things are written down and I need to use a, a magnifying glass to read. Um, it is indeed next year 30 years since I first visited Japan and it was love at first sight. I'm going to talk about that experience in a, in a little bit, but Japan has a very long and distinguished history with parasport. And this is something that became very apparent once we started to talk to our guests and research episodes for the podcast. It's worth thinking that 60 something years ago, um, there were no Japanese Paralympians. International sporting events for people with an impairment didn't exist in, in Japan. Um, although sporting events for people who are deaf and visually impaired have been taking place in Japan since the 1920s, the, the, the Tokyo Paralympics were, were really the very first games of their kind and actually took less than three years to organize, which when you think that from bidding to actually delivery of a games, it either takes seven, or in the case of the pandemic in Tokyo 2020, eight years, it's quite an incredible testament to the will of those people who were involved in the games. Um, sorry. Um, it's largely down to the work of a significant number of incredible people that we saw these games in 1964 take place. And chief amongst them was a young man, young doctor from my wife's home prefecture of Oita, um, by the name of Nakamura Yutaka. Now, Nakamura Yutaka was a visionary who'd actually done an in internship with Sir Ludwig Gutmann at Stoke Mandeville, birthplace of the Paralympic movement. He shared Sir Ludwig's vision for ex servicemen with an, an impairment, with a disability. Sorry, the language might get a little confused tonight, but he, at the time in Japan, if you suffered a spinal injury, the extent of your treatment was likely to be something called onsen ryoho, or massage ryoho, which essentially meant hot baths and massaging, which, as you'll probably realize quickly, doesn't lend itself to physical sort of achievement in any way, sense or form. But Nakamura Yutaka shared Ludwig Goodman's feeling that people with a, an impairment, with an acquired impairment, former servicemen, had much more to offer society. And he set about trying to achieve that potential, bring that potential out through sport. He was, a, he was an incredible man. Long before the, the, well, three years before the Paralympics took place in, in 1964, he actually, he was a man who loved his cars, but he actually sold his car to help fund a couple of Japanese wheelchair athletes to travel to the Stoke Mandeville Games in the UK to give them experience of international competition. And he went on to become the Dancho or head of delegation for the 1964 Games. His contribution to Japan, Japanese society, particularly for people with uh, an impairment, went far beyond sport, however. And he set up Sun Industries, Taiyo Noye, who meant, meant you might know the, the um, institution which provided employment and housing for people with impairments. He also um, was chief in developing a games which has largely be, been forgotten, a, a series of international games rather, called the FESPIC Games. Now the FESPIC Games took place between 1975 and 2006. There were nine editions of the games, two of which took place in Japan, the first of which, which took, took place in Oita. And this was largely down to Nakamura-san's you know, work with the support of the local community. The FESPIC games has largely disappeared from history, from any, that if you can find any reference to it in Parasport history outside, um, the work of Dennis Frost of Kalamazoo University, the, the academic who appeared on our podcast to share Nakamura's story, um, you're a better person than I am. It's, it's, it's a tragedy in a sense, because the FESPIC Games not only provided sporting opportunities for people with various impairments in, impairments in Japan, but also in East Asia. And Nakamura-san saw the power of sport to develop communities, individuals, societies outside Japan. So at, early in, in Japan's sort of contribution to international parasport, there is this strong commitment to developing 
regional opportunities as well, beyond Japan. Um, let me just catch up with where I am at the moment. Okay. Back in, the, in 1964, we, well, we were very lucky to interview Britain's very first ever wheelchair athletics gold medalist, a lady called Kaz Walton, who amazingly was also in Tokyo this summer for the second um, Tokyo Paralympic Games. She spoke very warmly of um, both good, Mr. Goodman and Nakamura Yutaka. She spoke very warmly of the Japanese people's approach to support, you know, the, supporting the athletes as they, and, their, and their hospitality. She did say there were some challenges around accessibility, and she spoke of having to be lifted on and off buses by groups of, of servicemen. Certainly, at that point in time, ac accessibility was an issue. But, you know, we mustn't forget that the significance of Tokyo 1964 as a game. It's the first games where the term Paralympic was coined. Running alongside, equal, on the same footing as the Olympic Games themselves. And it wasn't until 1988 that, Japan, uh, that sorry, international Paralympic athletes got the opportunity to compete at the same venue uh, under the same organization as their Olympic counterparts. So long time before, 24 years before that happened, Tokyo was breaking ground. And this is a recurrent theme. After the Games in 1964, there was another game, which again has largely disappeared from Paralympic sports history, the um, National Sports Games, which were athletes with m various disabilities. And forget that Tokyo 1964 was mainly for wheelchair athletes, took part from all the prefectures in Japan. And every year following 1964, that Games took place. So again, Japan's contribution to the global Paralympic sporting movement and the movement for athletes with an impairment is, is hugely significant. Okay, bear with me. <laughs> okay, probably the, most, the next most significant landmark, or chronological landmark in the development of parasport in, in Japan came in 1981 with the inception of the Oita International Wheelchair Marathon. Again, this was one of Nakamura Yutaka's projects. The man literally was an incredible visionary. Um, it's the only, it was the only international wheelchair marathon at that time. Apparently, they couldn't amalgamate that marathon with the Oita, uh, Beppu Oita Marathon, which is a, a hugely sort of historical marathon in, in Japan, because the Beppu Oita Marathon insisted that only people who could use their feet could take part in, in that race. But Nakamura Yutaka and the people of Oita again produced this event, which has been going ever since. And the wheelchair, the marathon world record, was actually set on the streets of Oita. Last week, I had dinner in the England Athletics Hall of Fame with, with um, David Holding, four time winner of the London Wheelchair Marathon. Speaks incredibly fondly of the welcome that he had in, Jap in Japan. So we get, again, that understanding that Japan has consistently not only sort of welcomed athletes with an impairment, but championed athletes with an impairment and been proactive in providing sporting opportunities. My first visit to Japan was in 1992 at the invitation of the Aoshima Taihiro Marathon, where, who were hosting the first World Marathon Cup for the visually impaired. Um, it, was, it was an interesting experience for me because earlier on in that summer, I'd come back from Barcelona with a gold medal around my neck um, in the 1500 meters, walked out of the um, arrivals entrance at, in Gatwick Airport to find a completely empty lobby, not a single member of the media there. I was with another friend of mine who'd won a marathon gold medal, so we hastily put our gold medals away, jumped in a taxi and got ripped off for a 150 pound fare back to, back to Essex. When we arrived in Japan later in that year, the arrivals hall of Miyazaki Airport was absolutely packed. Four TV crews, journalists, people from the local community. And it was absolutely, for me as, an, as, an, as a para-athlete, as an athlete with an impairment, that moment absolutely changed my, my life forever. It instantly, I, I fell in love with the people of Japan. I fell in love with the respect that the people of Japan had for us as athletes. 
Um, and it's something that isn't really recognised in, in, internationally, how much Japan has done for the Paralympic movement. Japan itself doesn't often realise or uh, how much it's done for the Paralympic movement, but it was a seminal moment in my life. I subsequently went on to train extensively in Japan, placing myself there before the 1996 Paralympics where I won two gold medals in the um, 5,000 and 10,000 metres, um, despite carrying a stress fracture, which I picked up in Japan from training a little bit too hard. But throughout that time, Japan's support for me as an individual for para sport was, was something um, that I, I, it's more, Nihon Atte no King Medal is the phrase I use. So without Japan, there would have been no, no gold medals for me. Looking more globally, probably the next most significant moment in the evolution of, of para sport with the Japan focus was the 1998. Nagano Paralympic Games, Winter Paralympic Games. And this is significant for a number of reasons. First of all, it marked the start of the relationship between the International Paralympic Committee and, 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 and Japan at the, at the Paralympic level and the IOC. But also in the way that the Japanese media started to tell the stories of para-athletes. So up to that point, sport had been some degree rehabilitative, um, but in 1998, not only the volume of media coverage was significantly greater, but how athletes were, put, uh, were portrayed as, as athletes first and patients second. One of our guests on Japan Sports Stories, uh, Miki Matheson, who works at the International Paralympic Committee Education Committee, won three gold medals in Nagano. Um, she spoke of her experiences. She um, didn't uh, become impaired until she was at university. She was involved in a road traffic accident um, and became a wheelchair user, user. And she spoke of how in Japan at that point she lost much of her identity, but more importantly, she lost much of her dignity. And those games went some way to redress that, but she said that still after the games, she felt that Japan still didn't offer the same opportunities as some other nations, and she subsequently moved to Canada, uh, married an ice, ice hockey player there, and is now working with the International Paralympic Committee, Education Committee, through the Who I Am program and, and, and the I Impossible program, to educate people not only in Japan, but also around the world, about what it means to have an impairment, you know, about it, what, how we break down boundaries, or how we deal with accessibility, inclusivity, and equity as issues. So, to listen to her episode, please, and, and to understand how important these sporting opportunities, and more importantly, actually, how important these in individuals are, not only to the development of parasport, but to the development of a, an inclusive, accessible, and, and equal society. I think one of, the, one of the real joys and privileges of co-hosting the podcast was getting to talk to Japanese athletes who have an impairment. Um, let me put these away. Um, and the new ambassadors of Japanese para sport, amongst them, two in particular, I would say Yui, Yui Kamiji, who's a female tennis player who won the silver medal in Tokyo. I'm sure she would have been um, <laughs> happier with the gold, but she also um, helped light the, light the cauldron. So it's an absolute delight to talk to her, although we spoke to her when she was in quarantine in a hotel room. Um, but her willingness to, to, to reach out to us and, and speak in, in perfect English about her experiences, she, what, what, she has an incredible international outlook. And I think this is something we're now seeing develop amongst Japanese para-athletes. Speaks Korean, studies French, studying cooking, doing all sorts of, you know, what, she, what she, I think she was also studying Chinese. But really embracing internationalism, um, Baron de Kubadan would have been very prou proud of her. Very, very, um, what's the word? Prolific in social media. A wonderful ambassador, not only for sport for athletes with an impairment and the Paralympic movement, but also New Japan. And the other person I think will stand out to me as a guest is uh, uh, Kimura Keiichi, who was a blind swimmer, is a blind swimmer rather, 
who from the age of six um, was uh, living and, and studying at a, at a school for the blind, so in a rio or a dormitory, much like my own experience. Um, spent 13 years working towards trying to win a gold medal in Tokyo, came up short in, in Rio, winning a silver, just, although he was still the most successful Japanese athlete, athlete at the Rio Games, but then moved to the USA because he was frustrated with what Japan, his, his training base in Japan. He felt constricted. He felt he needed to stretch himself and put himself in a different place to develop. And he took himself to the USA with no sight, no English, and just a, a real drive and desire to turn his athletic and personal life around. And the thing that he said to us that really stood out for me in an interview was, and was, and I'll do I'll say in the Japanese verses, Moshikashite boku ga sugoi atsukana, which roughly translates is, actually, do you know what? I think I might be quite amazing, I'm an incredible guy. And that is something, that level of openness is something that I hadn't heard from a Japanese athlete in any interview. Typically, even if a Japanese athlete wins, they're very modest and introspective and um, self-depreciating about the whole aspect. But this, that, that power and that confidence, I think, really strikes me as, as, a, as a milestone in how Japanese para-athletes perceive themselves and what sport does for people, individuals, communities, how it turns lives around, how it creates these incredible ambassadors for, hu for humanity. He did win the gold medal in Tokyo um, and I had tears running down my face because I know after 13 years what it is you know, to actually achieve something on the biggest stage in front of your, in front of your home crowd or <laughs> some of home crowd, shall I say. So the whole process this, of, of the evolution of, of sport in Japan, is, it's, it's taken six, six decades to this point. What I'm really looking forward to seeing now are the life stories of these three amazing athletes will be told in the film we're just about to watch. Um, ultimately, as with Fokuro-san's designs, this is about connection. It's about bringing people together. It's about each and individual one of us has the capacity to institute a change in our immediate environment, but with these athletes on a, on a far more global level. And, and the sum of that connectivity, the power and positive energy that we can create can do incredible things. As I said, not only for us as individuals, and, and we, God, we need it after the last two years to be coming together and to be connecting. Um, so I'm really looking forward to sitting down with you, um, watching Tokyo 1964. Um, I'll read that in a second. A festival of love and glory. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.